Let's have them. Hello, everyone. This is our 24th Dialogic Pedagogy podcast. And uh, we are having a very interesting theme this uh, time proposed by Tina Kuhlberg, who you already also see on uh, uh, the screen. Should we promote good teacher-student relationships in dialogic pedagogy? And if so, why? And what counts as good relationships between teachers and students? So this time uh, from Philadelphia, Eugene Matusov and Anna Mariana Shane, and from Sweden, where in Sweden? In the south of Sweden, in uh, Halmstad. In Halmstad, Tina Kuhlenberg. And we hope that other people also join us on Zoom uh, for this very interesting discussion. So let's start. And Tina, what did you mean when you proposed this topic? Can you define it a little bit more? Yeah, actually, I've been thinking the whole day and have a lot of <laughs> notes. <laughs> Good. I reflected, why did I suggest particularly this theme? And um, well, I think it's very important because I'm working a lot in the field, you know, about the field of relational pedagogy. It's sometimes conceptualized as relational pedagogy or dialogical pedagogy. And, and I came to the conclusion that um, the educational discourse on so-called good relationships uh, seems to imply um, quite different positions when you reflect upon it. So today I have identified uh, at least five distinct positions and I want to discuss them with you or perhaps you could develop them with me or yeah, let's see what they are. Face them or add something, uh, another aspect. So. Okay, yes, please start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you want to hear how I have named those yes. five? Yes. Okay. I present them first and then we, you can ask me more about them. Sure. Mm -hmm. The first, uh, the, more, the most general one, I call it the instrumental purpose because I identify five different educational purposes now and they also imply, they imply um, different student views also. We must have them in mind. Okay, so the first one, the instrumental purpose. The second one, what I call the caring purpose. And the third one, I call it the social justice purpose of critical pedagogy. Fourth, the dialogical purpose of student agency. It's, it's, our, <laughs> it's our position, I guess. And the fifth, I call it the talk purpose. And it's the more traditional social cultural Vygotskian uh, turn. So, I identified those five, and perhaps you don't agree, and perhaps they are not so dis distinct as I think. But I can see differences between those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's the instrumental purpose of a good relationship? Yeah. Uh, it's based um, on the general idea, you know, that good relationships, um, amounts to improved learning outcomes. And I hear it so often in the field of relational pedagogy and dialogue pedagogy. So um, in my eyes, this position reveals um, a somewhat manipulative, uh, did I say correct, manipulative yeah. mm -hmm. attitude to students. Um, because it's implying certain teaching behaviors um, in order to establish what I call effective classroom management. And, um, but it tend, uh, tends to end up as a controlling relationship, as I see it. For example, can I give examples? Yes, sure. Um, yeah. Um, I have heard uh, practitioners and also perhaps some scholars talking about it. when. An educator, a teacher uses humor and jokes or uses powerful charisma and or 
even I have heard even when they use physical contact in order to calm students mm -hmm. and certain behaviors to have an effective teaching, you know, so they do it instrumentally in order to to push through their agendas and their preset goals and, and so on. So um, all that with the intention to create willing and cooperative students. So basically that's my, what, what do you say about, do you recognize this approach? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds, sounds good, uh, kind of reminds me a little bit uh, writing, early writing by Alexander Sidorkin. Uh, mm -hmm. He kind of proposing uh, almost like uh, what uh, uh, Mark Smith and I would call the exchange of favors. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one way to do that. It's not just uh, you listed some other words like humor, mm -hmm. or even touching, and so on. But it's also could be exchange of favors. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the teacher does something important for the student mm -hmm. in the student's life, and in exchange, the student's willing to cooperate on academic learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did you call it, Yushin? Say it slowly. Uh, exchange of favors. We exchange of favors. Uh -huh. and, now I understand, yeah. And you give, it's like a transaction. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I see. I'm giving you something important for you, which is not necessarily related to education, uh, but maybe important for, like for example, some teachers, and uh, Alexander Sergudorkin brings many examples of that. Some teachers organize some important uh, uh, outside extracurricular activities for the students mm -hmm. like for mm -hmm. example, going to the uh, hiking together or doing something uh, sport games or mm -hmm. or just uh, actually becoming a uh, important confidence mm -hmm. or doing a therapy even mm -hmm. but in exchange uh, the uh, kind of they expect the students will uh, mm -hmm. cooperate about something, it may be yeah. a lesson, but right. the students will be sitting and listening to that or behaving or right. putting efforts in that lesson, even mm -hmm. if it's relevant and rather boring for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that. But again, uh, it's, it's just one ex uh, kind of way to do that, what Alexander Sidorkin mm -hmm. proposed. Alternative way, it's even, um, uh, he also proposed that just paying money to students like for their studies in a way that's also create this instrument instrumental uh, relations and Sidorkin was very open about that if you want students to work for you just pay them for that. yeah that's all and for you meaning for society even mm -hmm. like society needs them yeah. to study something and the students might not want to study that something mm -hmm. but uh, in a way uh, uh, good relations mediate that yeah and my my, my third uh, I have, I was not so consequent because I have positions, the third one is also instrumental, but this one was more general. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. so, okay, so what's your second one? Tell about Yeah, the yeah. One. thank you for <laughs> having this space. <laughs> um, yeah. is, um, what I call the caring purpose, and I'm very familiar with that because I know particularly Swedes who, who is actively working with um, the influences here uh, as I spontaneously see it is Buber. I, I think it belongs to this category. Mm -hmm. And also perhaps Nell Nodings. Do yeah. you know? Nell Nodings, yes. And, and the educators who are inspired from these thinkers um, actually actually advocates um, what they call an ontological approach. Mm -hmm. In my eyes, it's not totally unproblematic, and I will come to this, because although they, they really emphasize ethics in teaching, and ethics in relationships, in the terms of building trust, building safe environments, mutual respect, uh, relationships, and of course caring, because that was my uh, care. It's, it's, I have seen quite authoritarian and also very, they are very teacher-centered sometimes. Uh, and 
they are not problematizing the fact that relationships are very highly institutionalized, you know, they are conditioned by other agendas mm -hmm. to the teacher and the students. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the purpose, the educational purpose, purpose of good relationships here is the caring and, and is very ethical. I think that one of the biggest problems for, the, for this position that I, uh, when I was reading Nell Noddings, is mm -hmm. that we don't problematize who decides what's good, uh, what's not good, what, uh, yeah. uh, what, uh, 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 what is risky, what is not risky, what is safe, what is not safe. And because it's very often um, very strong in early childhood education and elementary school, the children are patronized or be or they're not being allowed to take various risks uh, because it's not good for them or it's risky for them mm -hmm. especially in united states where uh, a lot of education is the, defined by fear like a fear that something will happen to the students and that uh, that the uh, person who cares may be sued or uh, in some ways be harmed because they didn't care enough and they allowed things to happen that they should not. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me add something else uh, in addition. It's not like I'm, uh, you know, I like to disagree, but uh, not, <laughs> unfortunately it's not the case. Not this time. <laughs> not this time. And actually I agree about patronizing, but another part of this, it's this caring idea uh, uh, in education is uh, like overseeing that uh, divorcing in the relationship, divorcing from people has a hugely uh, important educationally. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes. And that's one thing. Another thing that education is not necessarily uh, like about relationship between teacher and the student. It's uh, education is, in my view, primarily, uh, it's a business of the students. If uh, they need teacher, that's great. If they don't need teacher, also it's great. And mm -hmm. if they teacher and they stop needing teacher, that's also great. Mm -hmm. And also there is possibility for divorcing as no, what I call non-fault non divorce. It's very important. It's like if you consider like not only education, but the family relations. You know, calling constantly caring, it's nice, but uh, it can be very abusive and patronizing and oppressive, and, and oppressive yes. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it's happened not because people are faulty in a way, but because, well, it's time to finish relations and just move on. And uh, I had this uh, case, a very interesting case of, uh, like, when I start fully uh, understanding that, uh, when I, that student who was completely disengaged in my class and was very, uh, doing very little, and back then I was grading, and uh, although it was difficult to get something less than A, uh, she got like C and so on and so forth. And then, by the way, she was not only disengaged with me, she was disengaged with the children. She's supposed to work in after school program. And she was uh, sitting, you know, uh, working on her phone or distracting my other students. And I sometimes even send, uh, you know, kids and kids, little kids, they're very cute and very powerful and, and asking for help. And she had no problem just pushing them away. So anyway, I bumped into the her a, a year after. And uh, usually it's my test on the street. And uh, it's usually the good test of our relations. Because mm -hmm. if they, uh, pretend that they don't know me, it means that mm, it's not good, something not good. Uh, in her case, she just jumped on me and was, I was uh, like, oh, wow, Eugene. So she was happy to see me. And I was like, why is she happy to see me if uh, I gave her C and she was disengaged and she was, and she explained that that class was extremely important for her, that class that she had. And the reason was she realized that she doesn't want to be a teacher. It was... Uh, mm -hmm. She saw that I was trying. She saw that it was uh, uh, up to the end, were not punishing her. Mm -hmm. And she's become puzzled herself, like why she doesn't want to actually study this or uh, why she didn't enjoy to be with the kids. And she realized that she wanted to be actress and not a 
teacher and that class was helpful. That divorce yeah. that happened, you know, that uh, a lack of the caring in a way, because like a lack of sensitive guidance, that was the guidance itself. And it's, and it's, I'm not saying that it's always like that, but I'm just saying that it's uh, the breakdown in the relationship can be important and has huge educational value. And you know, it's not, I don't need to care about her. And she doesn't need to me to care about her. Uh, you know, she, what she needed is to test her desire and the class helped her uh, to, to test her desire whether or not she wants to be a teacher or not. And she came to conclusion that she doesn't. And it helped her push her. And she said, if I pushed her further, like be more caring, probably I'm, if I succeeded, she would do things which would mask the problem for her. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, that's kind of uh, things. Because happen. she would start pleasing you and not really exploring yeah. her own yeah. issues. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very interesting. Yeah. You, know, you know, that sometimes that relationship, so called good relationship, is mm -hmm. open. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so it's problematic, like, um, it has its limitations in my view. Yeah, exactly what, what I thought this carry. Yeah, I have also a lot of negative uh, ideas about it. Yeah. So I think it's important to, to discuss it's it. It's important that you say that Boober, because uh, one of our mm -hmm. colleagues, Beth Fairholt, and I invited her particularly mm -hmm. to come to this room. Uh -huh. She did not yet. Uh -huh. Uh, because she wrote the paper, I have to uh, review it for her, uh, about love in education, uh, similar like Jane, I think she also wrote. Jane White. Yeah, Jane also writes it, yeah. About love in education, and I think that that notion of uh, uh, creating love, like uh, Boober was talking about, is really very uh, much an obstacle for education. I have to still see her article because I'm not sure what she wrote about it, so I cannot say what she thinks. But I know because I presented some of her uh, earlier trials, actually the conference in Rome, and because that topic for her is very long time and important. And also, as I said, it's it's much harder, I think, to deal with that caring relationships of early childhood education, even very small babies which Jane White is talking about, but I would say preschool or uh, preschool and kindergarten and the uh, early childhood uh, grades, like elementary school, because uh, yeah, people think that uh, uh, being so, uh, so uh, loving your student will be just nourishing for the person. And in that love, the student will blossom into a person. They don't see the oppressive side and exactly that side that sometimes moving away with no fault is much more important. That you don't owe anybody because love usually is very demanding. That you, if you get in that kind of relationship, it becomes very murky. Who owes whom what? That's not, that's why I'm not married. <laughs> 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 well, uh, <laughs> thanks for that joke, but uh, you know, what's interesting is caring kids could be very important, again, specifically for young kids, but not only for young kids. The question is, uh, what's the relationship with the education? Yeah. It's not like that caring is in itself not important, yeah. but sometimes Caring about other people is not education, right. and education is not about caring. Well, that the boundary is uh, it needs to be much more yeah. Thing, because, yeah, because you know there is a uh, all the Jewish song about a uh, young boy who is standing in the middle of the street singing about the tree, and he said, "All the birds have flown to the south from the tree, but I cannot fly because my mother put too many scarves and too many clothes on me." <laughs> 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 over, over, carrying. That sounds like very Jewish in my view, stereotypical Jewish. <laughs> but actually, I think Jane, speaking of Jane White, I think she has a good intention if we're speaking about that book. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Yes, yes. I'm, uh, as, as Eugene said, I'm not uh, against caring for children you know, or caring for your students, but it's some, uh, sometimes it goes along with education, but often it does not. Often it's... it's yeah, exactly, yeah. Flash. And, and temporary breakdowns could be... Okay, but have you seen, as I have seen, the authoritarian boober interpretations? Because... I'm somewhat concerned with, with the, the, I mean, there are also, um, feel, what do you say? It's about God and higher authorities. Yeah. Super address, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly, super address, that one. And <clears throat> I think it's, they are often educators in the barbarian style are often concerned of, fostering in the right way and, and, and you know yeah and uh, in my view this is like issue of patronizing that uh, anna was talking and you were talking about that as well uh -huh. when the teacher knows better uh, what yeah. the students need and what's good for the students mm -hmm. and yeah, exactly. in my view uh, of course uh, i know better what other people need <laughs> from my point of view <laughs> and, I, and yeah. I this is kind of nice of nice feeling that you know better is kind of uh, it's okay in my view when, when it's not okay when i'm start acting upon that mm -hmm. and uh, really start right, uh, right. like like of course i have my own uh, opinions and my authorial judgments about the world and there's nothing wrong about that and i see what's good what's not good for the world for myself for other people as well and sharing about that, it's not, not, it's not a problem. The problem starts uh, when <laughs> it's uh, when, especially in this relation with the students, that the students must submit to what I consider the good for that student and how the student should see the world and how the student should develop the voice mm -hmm. and what they should say and so on and so forth. This is where, and I can do it out of caring. And that's... Uh, in my view, that's um, the question is actually uh, interesting question to consider: Is it a bad caring, or the caring is bad? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a good point. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, in, the fact that they are trying to instilling certain values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can also discuss that that they have pre pre given values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very important if you are a booger. You're right. right. And that they are, like you said, super <coughs> address. <coughs> I don't think I don't think they think that the teacher knows best, but the God. Yeah. Right. Well, the teacher is always representative of the higher authority. Yeah, right. that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, of course, I guess a teacher I might think well. Uh, I might not know the best, but since I'm representing the best, so I'm a good proxy for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that. <laughs> <laughs> and you hope the students will not discover that you don't know the best. <laughs> well, it's not like I not hope, even if they discover, that's fine, but still this idea of uh, uh, patronizing, and it's especially as uh, uh, you were saying, Anna, that, it's, uh, that patronizing is uh, become uh, a big issue with younger students mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and again there is nothing wrong to some degree to patronize uh, students uh, uh, let me tell you give a good example of that uh, in some extreme situation and maybe not very extreme but they should be not confused with education well, uh, like for example of course uh, if i see that somebody trying to eat a poisonous mushroom mm -hmm. i should stop them and use my, in this case, I think that, that not I think, I know that I know best mm -hmm. uh, because the risk is huge mm -hmm. and it's better stop and it's okay if uh, the student will be upset with my patronizing mm -hmm. and my even violence because mm -hmm. uh, I'm saving life. But on the other hand, education. it's not education. <laughs> it's important aspect in life, but it's not education because mm -hmm. I'm just saving somebody life. It's just say because I tell you so. That doesn't mean or, or just know why. <laughs> and it's just not even say anything. Uh, my favorite example, actually, uh, which is real. I was several times saved. My uh, like my life was saved in South Africa 
because there is a traffic, wrong traffic uh, pattern because they have the same like British, which is wrong <laughs> traffic. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, a few weeks there, you pay attention and then you start relaxing. And a few times, completely strangers pull me back to the, on, to, uh, from the road because I was crossing and I was looking in wrong direction. And the car was passing, coming. And I don't need education, thank you very much. What I needed is like setting my <laughs> very violently, by the way. I, initially, I was like, what, what are you doing? Why are you pulling me? Like, you're a stranger. How, oh. how you are. But then when I realized that I was saved, I was, of course, uh, very thankful <laughs> for that. But, but there are situations, uh, extreme situations, when um, education is not the primary thing and caring is more important. Mm. And, and even patronizing caring more important, even violent caring more important. Mm. And but we need to understand that it's not education, just yeah. it, it's kind of another yeah. legitimate sphere of life, mm -hmm. but not education. Yeah. No, exactly. And I think the issue of freedom, I want to see more about addressing that issue in, in, in this caring parody. <laughs> don't you I don't know if nodding and boober are the same actually perhaps it's wrong of me to to just compare them what what do you think uh, uh i did not explore but i don't think nail noddings uh, uh has the same uh, ideas as boober or uh -huh. that she would uh, always agree with boober i uh, i think she's much more shallow than boober <laughs> anna excuse me what did you say that she was much more shallow than boober you know. Yeah, what, what does it mean? Sorry. Yeah, on, the, on the surface. On the surface uh, Aha! Okay, okay. So superficial. Yes. Superficial. She, she comes from certain, uh, uh, I think, uh, ethical standards that are very prescriptive mm -hmm. and not, doesn't problematize them. Yeah, I said, but, but in that respect, she goes well along with Buber Pratt because he is also very normative and in his... One thing that, uh, and again, it's a little bit uh, uh, moving away from our primary conversation mm -hmm. about teacher-student mm -hmm. relation, but it's about caring. Um, mm -hmm. One also interesting possibility to consider about caring in education mm -hmm. is uh, uh, this tradition that starts from, I think, Socrates or maybe Plato, mm -hmm. uh, who knows who, which one of them. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, Michel Foucault continued that. It's about mm -hmm. caring about yourself. It's like a, and in a way, it's very related to like education mm -hmm. as caring about yourself. It's not teaching yeah. about caring about students. It's about a uh, student caring about him or herself mm -hmm. as way to, uh, of education or mm -hmm. for world mm -hmm. of education. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting, but again, it's a little bit away from... Uh, no, I don't think it is. Oh, okay. But it's just like, uh, it's not re necessarily relational mm -hmm. unless you consider the relationship to yourself. Right. <laughs> but, but for the issue to nurture, let's say, in a student that caring for yourself, like, take care of yourself, ask what you need right now, do selfishly, like, demand this and that, that may be more dialogic than caring relationship. Mm. Interesting. I, I, That's I, provoking. Very interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Yes. That could be our next article. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, we got somebody. oh Brian. Uh, Brian. Hi, Brian. Hi, Brian. Brian, say something. He is still getting himself on that. He's staring. <laughs> <laughs> he looks I, like completely shocked. Are <laughs> you there? Sorry. Yeah. I didn't have any sound at first. Ah. <laughs> but it's so good to see my friends. Thank you. Hey, hi, Brian. Just you look shocked. <laughs> 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 okay, so we, uh, you know, uh, Brian, uh, Tina just was presenting five types of the teacher student good relations in education, and we just discussed two of them. Uh, okay. One of them instrumental. It's like uh, uh, it's kind of having relations of, in order to uh, good uh, conformity from the students. Yes, like ah. that. Okay. Let's say, like something uh, uh, like exchange of favors, but in uh, various ways. It's you using uh, humor, charisma, 
or uh, exactly for physical yeah. Yeah. contact. Yeah, so, yeah. I, there's a lot of danger of guilt and shaming, I think, in that yeah. kind of relationship. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How? Tell, tell us. Well, if it's an ins instrumental, things have a goal in mind. So the goal is to get the student to act in a certain kind of way. Yeah. And if they're not acting in a certain kind of way, then uh, how do you use that relationship other than like guilting and shaming to mark the one end of the boundary? And it's, it's, uh, yeah, like you owe this to me. You're my, you know, whatever, how you want to find that relationship. And it's manipulative, isn't it? it it's, yeah, well, the manipulation is what is done then in order to generate that emotional yeah, yeah. reaction and get the student to do what you want. And, yeah, and you can and say, uh, like, look what I have done for you. <laughs> right, yeah. I thought, I thought we were on good terms or, you know, any of those kinds of things. It, mm. Yeah, it's... Um, yeah, it's conditioned. Well, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I think when you say conditioned, I think of behaviorism, and this is this is more in kind of an emotional domain, I think. In ethical. Oh, sure. I don't think. No, no, it's also uh, uh, exploiting, exploitative. It's, yeah. Uh, well, you're exploiting the relationship. Yes, yes, which yeah. is not necessarily behaviorist in nature. It could right. Be, it's really based on ethics. Like, you're really good to somebody, and uh, somebody kind of feel uh, obligated, oh, nice. obliged. Yeah. No, I don't think I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's behavioristic. When when Tina said um, uh, conditioning, that's what I thought of behaviorism. I don't. Think uh, it's but I, I I didn't mean that. Okay. I, okay. I, 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 meant, um, I mean that I want something back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A little no. earlier that what I experienced as a very very young teacher in Soviet Union, um, I had actually. Uh, class which is considered is it mostly working class and actually uh, some of them may be below working class in the sense it was like uh, i had uh, kids who came from the uh, generation of the crime and they kind of socializing in that as well so it was a difficult class it was sixth grade which is in the united states will be considered be seventh grade mm -hmm. uh, and um I stopped doing a lot of interesting activities for the kids, with the kids, with some, some kids couldn't read, for example, in that seventh grade. And I was teaching physics, but we stopped doing, like, uh, these boys, some, some of them that kind of most difficult kids from the school point of view were boys. And I invited them to help me to do, prepare to the next classes for other classes, not only for their class, but for others. And they get very excited to engage in doing experiments with me because that was part of the part. Anyway, but it's interesting when I get in trouble, which is unfortunately I cannot say that I was very good at that, where actually my peers, my teachers, my colleagues, were trying to exploit me, my good relationship with the kids. Yeah. And them. And so it was pressure on me, not on the kids, but... Yeah, exploitation by proxy. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it, uh, I, again, I wouldn't say that I'm very proud how I solved uh, this kind of pressure. Uh, but, but I'm just interesting clear that some, sometimes that pressure can be not between the teacher and students, but it's actually... <laughs> it could be between teachers and students, but mediated by another teacher, mm -hmm. like was me, in my case. Because I was doing that not because I wanted good uh, behavior in my classes. That's not what was my... I was trying to find something like me, like... Uh, I'm trying to... My goal was to find some kind of uh, education that was meaningful for these kids in, in what I was teaching. So it was not the uh, idea to make them behave well in my classes. It's just like engage in something that they, without being able to read, some of them, Definitely actually. That will be very interesting. And they were doing really physics, not like pretending doing physics, and something that's really interesting for them. Mm -hmm. So, but of course, by doing that, uh, uh, you know, I developed very good relationships with them that other teachers saw as very useful to exploit. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, instead of becoming a firewall for them, I was in, to some degree cooperated or trying to find some kind of good uh, balance of that, which mm -hmm. is, was always terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. It's very interesting. Yeah. Really?
I, uh, you remind me in, in that story that sometimes uh, not trying to develop good relationship in order for me teaching the instrumental, it can, it, can, uh, it can just materialize because you are creating interest of the students uh, through provocations or experiments or something that to students feels like you're caring about them or you know them well or you can yeah. kind of like you're on their side because they, they can feel that this uh, as a relation, uh, not just coming from them in their interest, but kind of like you are a good teacher because so somehow it relates to them. And yeah. that can translate into them feeling that you're caring about yeah. Well, then you are caring. You are, them. but, it, but uh, not, you're not coming from caring. You're coming from engaging them in intellectual, uh, interesting uh, things. Uh, and it becomes mutual kind of like matter together. We can talk about these things together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's your next uh, thought? Uh, we... <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, I just tentatively um, named it the social justice purpose of a bigger... It's a frame... Do you say frame? Or, or that frame. Classical. Um, what... I pay attention to here in this position is uh, the idea of empowering students to think critically um, with respect to power issues, social justice issues, and when coming to the issue of relationships, isn't it that like that that they are promoting um, equality and non-asymmetric relationships? Or I guess it depends. On what Sorry, I was just, I must add one thing. This is also, as I see, is a kind of instrumental because it's serving the society, so. Yeah, I guess it depends on your version of justice and who's uh -huh. defining that. And, um, uh, and you know, sometimes there's views that uh, getting rid of people, eliminating them are, is beneficial to society. You know, but then you say, what is society? It certainly doesn't include those people then, does it? Um, mm -hmm. and there's, there's also the word empower, I often find to be mm -hmm. problematic too, because mm -hmm. so often it's used in the idea of, um, again, instrumental ways. You're, you're, yeah. you're giving people the ability to do what you want them to do. That's so often how the word empower is used. It's not really about mm -hmm. giving them power to do what they want to do, even if it's not something you want. Um, at, at least that's my observation of how that word's often been used in the social justice context. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I also have this pro similar problem that uh, Brian was talking about. It means uh, empower. And then I don't know, is it empowerment a bad just term or is it bad metaphor or something? Because it means that I have power and I just given it to you because you don't have that power. Yeah, and give, I'll give power. Yeah, and let me give yeah. an example. All right, like there is sometimes, let's say, shy students or the students who are very marginal in my class for whatever reason. It could be uh, uh, for kind of history of that or situational or whatever. And uh, I'm uh, kind of promoting that students to talk. Let's say when I promote, it's not I promote because I want to empower the student. But I like want to know what the students think or feel or uh, to share, like what, what, how the students understand the world. So that's because it's interesting for me, and I think it should be interesting for other students. And I think it can be might be interesting for that student who, if that student feel uh, okay to to share that. Mm -hmm. But it's not about imp empowerment. On the other hand, it might if you look at that from outside point of view, you say, oh that student was empowered by talking. And my students later might say, you know, this is maybe the first time class or the first time I'm talking publicly mm -hmm. and feel good about that. Uh, that's maybe true as well, but that's in a way, not what, it's kind of almost like byproduct of this kind of uh, thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of sociological concept maybe, mm -hmm. but not pedagogical. It's not like, oh, let me empower that student. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, equality is, is a key word here, equality. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and that's even worse term for me because equality mm -hmm. implies that we are equal <laughs> yeah. and rather than unique. When I'm interested in uh, other person, what they say, it's not because I'm equal and there should be two minutes for every age student because I cannot divide mm -hmm. all the time in the class. Uh, should be equal and what forbid some students will say talk three minutes instead of two that that sounds like monopolizing the space right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so i'm kind of i understand people when they talk about uh, equality i understand the concern i understand when people say disempowered they also understand the concern but in my view it's a wrong i feel it's very really wrong language it's very misleading mm -hmm. About equality as well. Why we should equal, be equal? Uh, it's not about equal that the problem is. It's the problem that we cannot realize ourselves. Uh, we, we cannot experience an oppressive environment and so forth. It's not about equal. I don't want to be equal with anybody. I want to be with me. Yeah. Mm. But Eugene, can may I ask if, if you think about the teacher in relation to the student? Mm -hmm. Our issue. Do you do you do you prefer equality in that sense? No. 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 When you say equality, what exactly do you mean? No, I I just refer to this, you know, discussion about asymmetrical or symmetrical. Also, I mean, I mean to give some credits to this Freire approach. They were aware of um, the power issue and the problem of being too authoritarian as a teacher. Mm -hmm. mm. Because since Freire uh, and, uh, and this human rights approach in general is very political. So yeah. uh, in, in a way it is trying to get people uh, politically to be on the same side with you. Mm. In a way it, you have an agenda because you would not uh, uh, allow people who are uh, anti-equality, let's say, or right wing to uh, keep their opinion. Uh, that yeah. be, because it, it's, it's, a, it's a political struggle to win over with certain opinions. And in that sense, it, it has that uh, very strong agenda. It's not about equality. It's really about the political agenda of uh, 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 not education, but life. Like to have maybe equal opportunities or to have uh, equal rights to fight for your rights or something like that. However, in, from the point of education, uh, that's not explored. And the relationship in the class still stays very much asymmetrical, even though they may pretend that you have a right to not do or to uh, construct the curriculum or this and that. I don't think that that's the case. And we have, uh, for instance, I wrote a, uh, together with a few colleagues uh, and Eugene, a paper about the idea dying in the classroom. And one of our colleagues that was co-author, she had a case she was uh, teaching in a very conservative uh, yeah, state in the United States and uh, about exactly human rights issues, trying to get the, her students, future teachers, to uh, appreciate diversity, Latino culture, or just tolerance. And they were giving her a really bad time back. They did not want that ideology to be pushed on them like she was. Mm -hmm. Mm. So it's it's, uh, it, it's not about uh, uh, about being let's say the student number one in the class. In in that sense, we are all students, so we are on like um, nobody's an expert. Everybody should be learning something at the same time. That's not about that uh, that Freirean approach, but it is about the certain political agenda that you want to get people to um, yeah. to actually. You want to teach them toward that end point. Yeah, and that's that's why I I I call it a, an instrumental approach. Also, it is Isn't it? it is instrumental. Mm -hmm. It might be you ask me about like <clears throat> issue of power and not uh, in this approach, just in general issue of power. I think uh, in my view, my students should have definitely more power than me. Ideally, mm -hmm. 
in the class. It should be not definitely equal. And uh, I'm coming there to help them. I'm not coming, uh, I, in this case, I, I right now currently think that I should have teacher orientation, which is exactly indicator that, uh, about that uh, realization of the student's power. In a way, uh, like I'm not just coming, uh, right, right now I will see, well, right now I'm not teaching you, and uh, at least I'm not in the role of the teacher at all. Uh, any teaching accidental. And I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> because I think you as my colleagues, so I'm, I'm kind of, uh, in this case, I feel so-called equal, but equal, of course, not the same. But I don't see neither, like, uh, there is, it's not even equal. It's just like every person unique, and I don't have a special, any special role except representing myself, which is not a role at all. Because uh, it's not, I'm not, I am what I am. Uh, yeah. But uh, in class, I'm not like that. And I actually tried that. And I realized that it's a bad idea to be like that, what I'm right now with youth, with my students, because uh, for many different reasons that they need a special uh, things. Like, for example, uh, they need nurturing. They, like, for example, my students uh, do not know what I think unless they ask me. I will not share what I think. Uh, and the reason for that is because I don't want my opinions to be uh, considered uh, like at any point uh, as something like higher or uh, when I argue with them, I'm arguing as uh, they know that I have a special role and I will change that. Uh, and, uh, and they know that. They know that it's not me who's talking. I'm always, like, even my point of view, I can present usually as somebody that said this and that. That's something maybe me, but the students don't know that until they ask my opinion, and in this case, I honestly share it. So in a way, I'm just saying that I have a special role, and my role is to help, if they need help. Of course, I'm working very hard against uh, tra this traditional institution, and my own upbringing, and my own practices, and whatever that, uh, kind of colonized me, and uh, uh, which, of course, bring uh, that asymmetry in opposite direction. That's true as well. Mm -hmm. But in my view, the ideal way is to, my students have power, and uh, uh, they can overrule things, uh, and I cannot overrule them. Yeah. Uh, but of course, institutionally, the problem is, this is our colleague of uh, Jim, written model <laughs> from uh, the German name. Great Mulder. Great Mulder. Great Mulder, yeah. Mulder. Great Mulder. Yes. Anyway, I need to learn German too, because it means something. <laughs> to learn this name. You <laughs> learn <laughs> this name. <laughs> Overdo it and learn the whole language because of what? Yeah. Well, well, and he's calling us benevolent dictators and of course he's right because like we see these wonderful regimes democratic regimes but the students know that at any point we can pull it out it's not like we want to pull it out but, but we, behind us there's all this institution that gives us power to do that mm -hmm. yeah well, good yeah can we go back to the word equal yes yes yeah, um, so I, I think it was Aristotle you know, was talking about praxis, and praxis can only happen among equals. And I think there's all sorts of problems with the word equal implying sameness. And I don't think Aristotle meant sameness. I think Bakhtin is, uh, talks about equal rights. Being, having equal rights is not like being equal. Ah, yes. Um, hmm. And actually, in Slavic languages, there is a, that word "equal rights" is different from the words "equal." Yeah, but do you ever earn your rights, uh, either through um, attaining like skills or abilities or certifications, or um, and you know you may have had unequal opportunities just because of place and time and all sorts of things like that. So I question this idea, do you ever have equal rights? And that, that's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah, 
But on the other hand, I think that that's also a relational, uh, a relational moment where you uh, can, can have another person feel and they can have you feel that you have equal rights to have your own opinion. Mm. You have to be Pleasure. saying they don't have to overlap, but, but you have a right to have it and to talk about it. It doesn't mean that uh, people will not refute you or not try to tell you that they doubt it or not, but it's, it's a, your opinion has a right among other opinions and, and has a right to be voiced and expressed and is welcome also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That brings me to my fourth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to to uh, proceed? Yeah. yeah, please. Yeah. So my my fourth um <clears throat> position here is is uh, your dialogical and mine um, the dialogical purpose uh, because Brian I I, I identify uh, educational purposes distinct uh, educational purposes behind the rhetorics of good relationships you okay. see mm -hmm. yeah. so the fourth one is our bactinian i would say bactinian approach where all participants is giving a voice or agency and i consider it as a ontological approach mm -hmm. okay I must go, you can discuss, I must have a, um, I must have a battery, you know. Oh, you have to bring your charger to the computer, right? Yeah, it's okay. urgent, you can discuss. All right. <laughs> no, we cannot say anything smart. All <laughs> 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 the stupid things. Right. Well, I don't know, can you hear us, Tina? She probably had to just step out. No, that, that is no. No. <laughs> ah, there you are, Tina. <laughs> All right, are you are you able to hear us? Are you with us? Yeah, I'm, here. I'm listening. Okay, so, so Eugene, uh, this this approach makes me think of your um, uh, was it the Four Ages article where you talked about the age of responsibility? Yeah, well, it's not necessarily the issue of responsibility yet, but probably yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ethical responsibility, I think. Right, right. That, why does it remind you of that? And how does it have a dialogic, a good uh, well, definition of good dialogic relationship? What, what's good in the dialogic purpose of relationship? <laughs> um, and I, I lost a little bit of my thought as you're getting your charger, Tina, and I apologize. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> um, okay. Do you remember what you said that may prompt my memory as to what you were? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I said it was an ontological approach. And in my view, I think good relationships, um, in my interpretation, of back, the Bactinian approach here is the genuine interaction of consciousnesses as I mean the gen the all what you say it's a genuine relationships mm -hmm. beyond instrumental purposes uh, it's about real curiosity and an agency ah, okay so okay. I, I yeah I think um, I I I would be careful being using the word genuine because you can have genuine uh -huh. instrumental relationships, right? But I think, um, Eugene, you used the word uh, about purifying relationships. Uh -huh. And maybe that's a useful idea uh -huh. in that it's um, the basis of the relationship is not on instrumentality. Uh -huh. I can have a purified relationship. I, I'd say it may be hard even among friends not to have any instrumentality ever happen. Um, but the basis of the relationship is not one that's instrumental. It's purified so that it can be something else. Um, and I'm guessing in this sense, the relationship exists for the sake of the relationship. Mm. And it's not oriented towards a specific goal. Yeah. And, 
and operating in praxis, the, the goals may emerge in context of that relationship, but they can be just as readily abandoned as you kind of explore them. So, mm -hmm. and I, I, again, I, I forget what my thought was relating it to the age of mm -hmm. responsibility, but in, in my view, it sounds like this is very much in that kind of uh, praxis space where you can respond to others and they can respond to you and and you own your thoughts you're not just acting as an agent of someone else so it is really about you your thoughts and you're responding to them and also for me this kind of the, the authorial approach that you yes. yeah. has developed or yeah mm -hmm. but also this kind of relationship and that they are not um harmonious necessarily uh, no. <laughs> so for good relations, they are not necessarily good because there is harmony. Actually, no, they exactly. Yeah. And again, they can lead to divorce, uh, uh, either full divorce or no full divorce between uh, or among the people. And it could be full of dramatism and uh, pain even sometimes. Uh, so it's very kind of a life type of relations. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that... Uh, Brian, for you, you always kind of uh, model that by kind of friendship. Mm -hmm. And uh, you often checking whether or not, uh, like, and it's a good question whether or not educational relations should be like a relationship among friends. And again, that uh, uh, this idea is common, like, for example, uh, in each was talking about, mm -hmm. Ivan Ilyich was talking about something mm -hmm. like that, although he's sometimes going to uh, on the boober side as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's difficult to say how religious it is, it become almost like mm -hmm. godly relations. Right. Uh, and, but if you think about just relation among friends, and friends' relationship, they are also not necessarily always harmonious, uh, involved mm -hmm. a lot of drama, <laughs> yeah. Not idealized friendship relationship, but real friendship relationship. They are uh, kind of full of pain sometimes, um, a, a lot of enjoyment as well. Uh, so it's kind of rich relations. And um, and again, the question is whether or not uh, relationship with the friends should be uh, should drive relationship among um, uh, teacher student relations or not. My my suspicion is not. Because mm -hmm. I would, I, again, because I'm saying that I have, uh, as a teacher, I have a special role. I don't think I have any special role uh, with uh, my friends. Although, uh, in some moments, I might have, but overall, I don't. And I have a special role overall with my students. At least how I understand that now. I, I wonder, um, I don't know, a number of things you're saying make me think of my own classroom. And I, I thought of the ideas of positive and negative freedom might be helpful in explaining it. Um, in what way? Well, uh, I think as a teacher in a public school, uh, there are certain things I have to do. And as a result, there are certain things I have to ask of my students. And if I can identify what those things are and say, okay, that's it, and that's the boundary, uh, everything else you're free to do, that's negative freedom in a sense. I so say you're completely free to do whatever except this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. And if we understand that, then our relationships can exist outside of that. But these things are non-negotiable. Unless you see another way that I can navigate it, I'd be open to hearing that. But this is my understanding of the non-negotiable things. So, in a way, you want to put the non-negotiable things outside of your relationship because they are demanded by school and to create a uh, very clear boundary that you will be uh, in a, in a non-impositional relationship with them outside of this boundary. But that boundary is not imposed by you, but by the institution. Yeah, and my understanding of how to navigate the institutional requirements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting to consider uh, teacher-student relations not only by itself, but within the constraints mm -hmm. of the sometimes very oppressive institutions. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. And I think it's two issues, like uh, what it will be without 
can uh, these constraints and what it will be inside of constraints and uh, mm -hmm. yeah and uh, and I also like this uh, uh, part of that I really like uh, Brian's idea of this uh, taking responsibility mm -hmm. of ethical part mm -hmm. uh, like uh, that or demand responsibility yeah and, uh, and I think that's very also important and again and then, again you huh? What did you say? Well, What's I think that, that uh, no, uh, like uh, taking responsibility and demanding responsibility Demand. uh, from each other, and uh, that's uh, also mm -hmm. important. But again, for me, that's not necessarily symmetrical mm -hmm. things uh, because a lot of a lot of things uh, uh, because I'm. Uh, when I feel when I'm in classroom, let's say my classroom, I know that I'm for my students. It's not like students for me. And, uh, and the students should be for themselves there. Mm -hmm. And I came to facilitate the process. Mm -hmm. And of course I can have some enjoyment of my own, but it's kind of, again, it's kind of a uh, byproduct rather than uh, I had to demand that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh so you're not in the role of student number one? Uh, in that sense, no. Okay, what about that role of a teacher, to be a student number one? Uh, uh, which is kind of like more different uh, relationship to other students. Well, uh, this type of role, in my view, it's called a meta role, rather than a real role in... Uh, real role in the particular the classroom it's kind of role of being interested in life mm -hmm. and that's kind of in this case it says uh, but number one yeah, okay, uh, okay. Right. Uh, but not necessarily uh, let me again uh, i have realized that while reading actually plato uh, his uh, dialogue piano when socrates uh, if i just want to remind you about that so there is a uh, uh, Leno, who is a young, rich man, he came to Socrates and he wants to discuss an issue about origin one of virtues. Is it taught or is it, na is it nature or nurture? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a simplifying way. And for Socrates' point of view, as a learner, mm -hmm. uh, that question is irrelevant. The most important question is, what is virtue? Mm -hmm. And there is, uh, at least for maybe 20 first pages, there is a struggle between uh, Meno and Socrates for uh, both, uh, What's the focus of, what the focus of their discussions. And at some point, Socrates suddenly, it was a hard moment for Socrates, you can say. He can say, wow, you actually came to me, I didn't come to you. And we should discuss your topic, not mine. Mm -hmm. And I think this is uh, where... Uh, in a way, the teacher orientation was framed. Uh, it's, uh, there is no equality there in that sense, or equality of influence. I mean, the equal people also can fight for the topic. That's mm -hmm. true as well. But the resolution of that is very different. Here, the teacher has to bow to the, uh, uh, the interests of the students and not push their own interest, learning interest. And this is like choice of the curriculum. Who defines the curriculum? Yeah. yeah. But then, once the curriculum is on the table, there is also a position of but the... But the curriculum never on the table. Well, because we it's decide now, we will discuss... Yeah, but, uh, but, uh, but it of can go in some... Okay. Yes, it's never on the table. And so, that's, so it should be always driven by the students. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And again, you, it's not that necessarily the teacher follows that, because the teacher provokes and so forth. But uh, it's exactly the student decides what and certifies that this is what we're doing and mm -hmm. what we're following, what this is what interests us. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, it's not really by the teacher, it's in my view, the teacher values the role, and, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, or it can happen accidentally, which is fine. Mm -hmm. so that's fine. Very interesting. And what's the role then of biological vocation 
uh, in that kind of relationship where the students full right to they themselves bring if they bring them why do you need to have provocation i think you still have to have a provocation because you can uh, create a point of view that's very unusual, or just as an alternative way. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. some start at thinking, you know, right. like you thought that you were talking about it, but what about that? Yeah. So it's kind of like a, in order of the point of wonder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and of course the teacher brings a lot of things that uh, then change the direction. That's that's fine, but again. The, uh, the, the final authority about the reaction on curriculum is the student. So the interest of the teacher is uh, the students' ideas and how to guide the students to develop and examine these and test these ideas more, and not uh, the, anything that the teacher thinks is important for the student. They can just bring things. In, in in the play, let's say, but uh, but then uh, guide the students to explore them. Yeah, in a way, I cannot afford, in my view, in my position, to say, you know, that topic is not interesting for me, even if it's true. Uh, it mean, if it's not interesting for me, it means I cannot guide that and let other students guide uh, themselves that, mm -hmm. and that's fine. But that's they should continue that. It's not like I, I have to interrupt that because, oh, that's not interesting. No. But, but, but if we have a relational take, I think it's very important to bring in the concept of intersubjectivity. And here I'm very influenced by Eugene's article about 1996, I think, intersubjectivity without agreement. Mm -hmm. because usually you and also social cultural scholars defines intersubjectivity as a as a harmony consensus shared yeah. standings and i think in this fourth position here i think it's important to highlight that intersubjectivity could be about tensions about disagreements mm -hmm. or yeah and for me it's it's about interest like interest in another person that was yeah interest in the ideas of another exactly person. but they could clash yes exactly and which can create a tension among them that's fine if they disagree but you but don't want to be in tension with them not in your role as a teacher no no it's i can be in the tension with the of students course. Role oh I, why but it's not my tension it's, it's, it's not because you're not presenting it as your position but as yes. one of the yes. potential. Uh, and I can go uh -huh. as very often. I say, well, as a devil advocate, let me bring, what would you reply to that? Uh, and I will put that. So the students very much know that they're not arguing with me. They're arguing with this imaginary uh, kind of thing. Uh -huh. Although it could be even my, accidentally, it could be my position mm -hmm. that they argue with. But they don't, but unless they ask me what I think mm -hmm. about. But actually, in Sweden, my teacher students, they, they are not so sensitive about this. It's, they like to have a debate with me and mm -hmm. uh, if, if they feel safe, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing, that uh, uh, despite disagreements, uh, this uh, safe learning environment is mm -hmm. a condition to create where everybody feels safe to express what they think. Exactly. Yeah. And where, uh, that's where, where uh, uh, the, it's in the relationships that you appreciate and interested in uh, another person's opinion. They are very important to be voiced. Exactly. And that's why I mean that the normal definition of intersubjectivity is, is misleading and, and, and it's not good because if you establish another approach to them, that it's okay that we, we clash and mm -hmm. they, they like to. Right. To also, the intersubjectivity uh, uh, that, that assumes that you can know exactly uh, what another person thinks or read their mind. Uh, the yes. achievement can be always expressed, uh, but never uh, it's never full or, uh, or exhaustible, or maybe it's not then uh, uh, examined. So uh, uh, it's always uh, kind of like not 
uh, it, it's accepted as maybe in the classical uh, uh, school as as a proxy for the student learn something when they agree with you. But yeah, yeah. actually, yeah. there is no way to see whether there is any overlap between consciousnesses or that. Yeah, it's about erasing the gap between. Mm -hmm. And I think this is this is, could be misleading because we should uh, promote the gap, mm -hmm. gap between persons and use them as educational resources. Perhaps so it's very interesting because that there is a catch there that I see. On one hand, people are very uh, attached to their ideas, like Bakhtin's idea of person idea. You cannot. Uh, separate people from their ideas and positions. On the other hand, all these different differences between positions that create tensions uh, also create a tension for the subjectivity. When your idea is refused, yeah. you feel that you are, you as subjectivity is being broken down. And yeah. so, <laughs> yeah. so creating safe environment where you can raise your voice, but at the same time, yeah. Yeah. everybody, uh, uh, be able to test their ideas and not feeling diminished, that's the tension. Yeah, exactly. Not feeling threats every time. In my view, part of education, that's exactly what it should be about uh, breaking this uh, tough grip uh, on the between ideas and the people. People should be always above mm -hmm. ideas, not, uh, uh, not uh, too much uh, Collapsed into the ideas. Right. Yeah. So of course, you exactly. have to create the ambivalence and uncertainty in order for anybody to transcend anything. Yeah. To start doubting in their own ideas, but without feeling doubt that they are not appreciated as a person. But in the the conventional educational discourse, I think. Could it be, it's, it's a lot of assessments and evaluations, and I think students, perhaps that adds up to the sensitive things. Mm -hmm. you, know, if you feel that you are assessed every time you have an opinion or... or yeah. You know, this... Well, yeah, even their opinion is not valued at all. Who cares what their opinion is? They, yeah, they need to know only the truth, the correct things. The opinion is not important. Mm. And in, in my view, dialogic pedagogy, opinion is number one, it's most important. From opinion, things start. Yeah. yeah. If you don't have opinion, it means you don't care. Or well, you're not the author because yeah. you can only be the author of your own opinion. Yeah, if right. you don't have opinion at this moment, you're not an yeah. author. Yeah. I see my tutorial. Yeah. 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 So what's the fifth? Yeah, the fifth. <laughs> yeah, the fifth. Um, it's just my idea. I'm curious to hear what you, if you agree with me, but the fifth is a more Vygotskian take. Um, a more, Brian, are you are familiar with Vygotsky and social culture? And Vygotsky and what? Yeah, and, and the trad classical sociocultural ideas. Um, sociocultural. Yeah. So, so, sociocultural for, from the Vygotsky uh, point. I think so. Let's see. Yeah, uh, because as I interpret it, in, I call this category the talk purpose, the educational purpose of creating good relationships is because they emphasize uh, the need of talking and reasoning. Uh, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so in order to create talkative classrooms where students are supposed to participate with public reasoning, um, uh, good relationships by implications are necessary in that respect. So it's also instrumental in a way. Oh, very instrumental. Very, uh, exactly, and I know that. And I also know, yeah, I think that Vygotsky's concept, for example, the zone of proximal development and 
Bruner's uptake here, uh, developing the concept of scaffolding, you know, that big influential tradition, paid the way for uh, instructional methods where communication is seen as a tool and a key to learn. Yeah, I agree with you. I would just add it should be harmonious, harmonious communication. Where yeah, yeah, yeah. And focusing on socializing mm -hmm. is harmonious. And also, I mean, harmonious in the sense of the teacher's perspective. Mm -hmm. it, the, the teacher, the expert view, Vygotsky emphasized the expert view and trying to erase the gap we speak about. We spoke, sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, you can uh, talk further. That was my uh, initial thinking here. Uh -huh. So it's almost like, correct me if I'm wrong, it's almost like uh, when I talk with you, like I'm listening to you and I will shoot mentally coding, aha. Uh -huh. uh, so, Tina um, uh, provided good meta uh, critical <laughs> meta thinking skills she yeah. added, uh, uh, arguments i'm coding when she provided uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, like she mentioned brunner yeah. okay okay references uh, good uh -huh. uh, she provided uh, <laughs> evidence check yeah. uh, she uh, also logically reasoning yeah. check and <laughs> then i developed like a lot of this check up i said well this is good yeah, what? she internalized all of that. Yeah, yeah, she internalized. Exactly. Something is missing or very rare happen. We need to work more on that, we, how we to we mediate that. We talk about that yeah. a lot more. Yeah, a mediate and, that, create some task where it's required for you to do that. Maybe I should model that a little bit, how to do that and so on and so forth. Is that what you're talking about? Like this, almost like discourse analysis. How many times you uh, provide the evidence in what you just said? Of course, of course. but my, of course, but my point here is, is is that the need of good relationships. I'm thinking that the need of that is because they want to nurture a, a, a classroom culture with communicating participants, you know, and then you need to have instrumentally good relationships or. I think one of our colleagues in Israel, uh, I just read this article recently, Adam Lefstein, talks about exuberant the dialogue. Mm. Tell me. You read, no. you read what? my proposal for the uh, yeah, yeah. I, What it means is it looks like in class everybody says something, people participating eagerly, but no, we were really testing on the idea. Yeah. But again, testing ideas become a part of this checklist. Uh, oh, testing ideas happen. So yeah, exactly. 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 Right. Yeah. Okay, but because students know that in your class it's very good that they should say something. No, no, but again, so uh, at the same time, they become good about testing ideas as well. Yes. <laughs> the thing is about that. It's kind of, I feel it's machinery of, it's actually structuralism and formalism because you mm -hmm. need to have. So uh, the, there is zero attention to real ideas, zero interest. The only interest is whether or not you have testing ideas or not. So it's about checklist things. Mm -hmm. uh, and to check if that's something missing from that checklist. Right. But uh, so talking about good relationships, it's more from the socio uh, socialization point of view. We all work together, like community of yeah. communities. We all uh, collaborate yeah, together yeah. On, on creating something together. Yeah. yeah, this is kind of, yes, it's collaboration. Uh, that's another type of relations of collaboration. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was... That's, uh, that's in yeah. that fifth talk. This, what you did is absolutely incredibly interesting, yes. These mm -hmm. five different purposes and then... Good. Good. Is good relationships. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for what purposes? Because they are different. Mm -hmm. Some of them are instrumental and some of them are more ontological. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brian, what's your... Well, that's interesting. You see that as a dichotomy, instrumental and ontological? Uh-huh. Yeah, perhaps. But how do you see? Well, I don't, I don't necessarily make that distinction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be very ontological that you want something instrumental. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, uh, of course, uh, uh, instrumental, it's not the issue that presence of instrumentality. 
the rule starts when instrumentality shapes the whole thing. Uh, and of course, when there is super instrumental relations, it's in order to be a good super instrumental relations or kind of powerful, it's definitely uh, heavily exploits ontology. So what makes it, it's, it's not like there is instrument, purely instrumental and purely ontological. The question is what defines the flavor of relations? The flavors are rooted in the instrumentality or flavor of the relationship uh, uh, rooted in ontological relations. Let me give an example, very funny example. There was a very um, interesting psychologist, Anne Brown. Unfortunately, she died prematurely of some bizarre disease that just almost killed her immediately. And uh, she actually introduced this notion, I think she, it was her who introduced notion of community of learners. And she had this uh, public, experimental public school where she was working uh, in Oakland. And I was actually located in Palo Alto, which is in California, which is not far away. It may be an hour away from, hour maybe and a half away from Oakland. And I wanted to visit uh, her school. And I emailed, uh, uh, can I come on a certain day? And she said, oh, no. You cannot come on that day because it's Tuesday. We're doing community of learners on, only on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> for me, this is a super, <laughs> yeah, super Like imagine that you have a family or you have a friends. Well, we are friends only on Monday, Wednesday, <laughs> or we have a family. <laughs> we have a romantic relations only on uh, odd days, but on even days, um, there is no relation whatsoever. I don't even know the person. On this day. Um. Uh, and for me, this kind of business relations, mm -hmm. uh, and, which is instrumental. And so, so for me, uh, this is what instrumentality. It's not like that. Uh, like ontological relations uh, are not instrumental as well. Of course, they are. You can find a lot of instrumentality in them, but mm -hmm. that instrumentality is subordinated, and sometimes it's in conflict, and sometimes even instrumentality temporarily become most important mm -hmm. in this relationship. Mm -hmm. Still, I would call it ontological mm -hmm. because the flavor, the overall flavor, mm -hmm. uh, ontological and non instrumental. And by the way, think that it's instrumental as well. At some point, instrumentality maybe subside an ontology there, but overall it still can be done on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'm thinking of um, a situation where the instrumentality, instrumentality and, and uh, ontology were, I'm, it's not clearly separating to me. I'm thinking towards the end of the last school year, a few weeks ago, there's a number of students I was working with where they needed to pass some classes in order to graduate. And, I'd meet with them, I'd meet with the teachers, I'd see what needed to be done. Um, and there's a lot of running around uh, those last couple of weeks. And my relationship with those students was instrumental and ontological. They wanted to graduate. They needed to do these things in order to graduate. I was helping them navigate those things with their other teachers in order to make that happen. So it was a desire for them, it was a desire for me. And yet, uh, it was our collaboration that was helping to make those desires realized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, absolutely. But nevertheless, with, uh, from what you described, and maybe I'm wrong, the overall flavor remains ontological and not instrumental. Well, it was that, uh, <laughs> but it was very much about that instrumental. No, it could be instrumental, but again, it could be in the context of ontology, but can be not. And in a way, this is where betrayal can happen. And uh, what, by the way, that's what I was talking about, my, uh, in a way, sense of the betrayal that's happened with the truth that I described when I was uh, a, a very novice teacher. Uh, and remember I was telling about that. I had a, a kind of a group of boys and we're working, but time to time I was betraying them because instrumentality was taking over the flavor of our relations. Not, uh, not because we were, like for example, when we even were working on preparing ex experiments, there is a lot of instrumentality was there. But overall the flavor was 
uh, we were talking about many things. We were like, uh, we had uh, real uh, life relations, including physics as well. As well as uh, there was instrumental, like for example, I had to prepare this. And at some point I, I uh, for example, had to tell them that I don't have any more time. We too much uh, like messing things around, which is good. But nevertheless, tomorrow will start and I have to finish. And this experiment should be, I mean, this preparation has to be done, right? You know, whether or not we want, although we might want to explore other things, we cannot explore other things. It's time to finish and just be productive, you know, be very instrumental, very collaborative, you know, at the expense of other things. We have to rush. And uh, it was okay, it was some tensions about that, but it was okay. But nevertheless, I'm talking about that flavor of what the whole thing is about. Are we really objects for each other, which is instrumentality? Are we tools for each other to achieve some kind of goals? And that's primary things become. Or we are human beings uh, with our relationship with each other and we, are, and we are interested in each other. And again, the question is, what the flavor of that? Because at a certain time, certain uh, instrumentality can take over, and that's fine, while the overall context is ontological. But it may be not. And then they collide with each other, and, uh, you know, there is breakdown of relations that could happen. Yeah, so... In a way that what you're talking about, uh, Brian, it's not necessarily you. For some time, you can be very instrumental with each other. And so, uh, it, you know, yeah, and I think it was. But at those moments, because of the fear of not graduating was on their mind. And they well, wanted relief yeah, from that. Well, then it's very ontological. Yeah, yes. it's ontological. Yeah. It's ontological and instrumental. Yes. They yeah, needed right. my help. And they wanted my help. And at any moment I was providing help, they wanted to be engaged in what I was talking and saying to them. But uh, the question is whether or not the relationship with you I reduced to, uh, for them uh, the tools of their activity. If it is reduced... It I can, I, sorry, can you say it again, Eugene? For me, the question is whether or not you become a pure tool for their activity. If you become a pure tool in the house, it means uh, the relationship are high. Hello. Hello. It is an ontological relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> 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 nice meeting you. My daughter. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah. So nice. if over, that's what I'm saying. If uh, this, uh, the people relationship will be defined by the fact that your object of, of their activity or a tool for their activity, and that's it. In my view, that's instrumental relations. Right. If, if uh, the relationship cannot be reduced to being uh, just a tool or an object, mm -hmm. it means it is ontological relations, if it is interest in the people. Mm -hmm. Although, again, at some point, uh, for some time, for some uh, things, it could be uh, instrumentality can take over. Sometime. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's still embedded in... Uh, it's not the driving force. Yeah. yeah. It's very interesting. So, mm -hmm. and the students are not just the object of a uh, teacher's actions and activities to be folded in some kind of way. And the, the, the other way, when students don't take the teacher only as an instrument for them to achieve something. But, but you can create... Uh, I think like a multi-dimensional uh, human relationship with each other that uh, has many levels and and I think that that multi-relationship creates that feeling of a, a safe learning environment because uh, it's not purified there are many things going on um, you can have a, a going to a, have a party or go for hiking together but not because you want them to return the favor and study, but because it's nice time spending together. And that gives another dimension to the uh, relationship. So it's not just purified, just our business is only education. If it's not education, I don't, yeah, but I, I, I don't like 
some of the different things because Bakuta is uh, in mesh relations. Uh, you can actually uh, in, intentionally complicate relations for the that's manipulative uh, goal. That's true, that's true. It, it, there, there should be a boundary and that we didn't explore. A good manipulator actually mm -hmm. do not want to purify things. Right. Because it is not Yeah, yeah. 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 Because uh, purifying things is actually makes things visible and easy to resist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good uh, generating uh, like uh, guilt is not when I'm telling you shame on you, but when you feel it yourself without me saying anything, without me saying that's oh, okay, it's okay. That's even stronger. Than being. Mm -hmm. So, in my view, there is conceptual duality between instrumentality and ontology, but of course, in practice, it's much more uh, complicated in much more dynamic relations. But nevertheless, it will uh, still uh, does not uh, eliminate this duality. And I'm very much, uh, as you know, unapologetic dualist. <laughs> <laughs> Dualist <laughs> and dualist. <laughs> because there is nothing wrong to be dualistic uh, when it's good, if it's useful. And it's okay not to be dualistic when it's not useful. <laughs> well, I think it's time for us, unless we want, we, all, we only spent two hours. Oh, no, hour and a half. And a half yes. Yeah, but anything, uh, quick things, uh, maybe we can say something. Like Brian, what do you want to say? If you want to say something. Yeah. <laughs> nice <laughs> <thing> everyone. <laughs> <That's just smart. laughs> yeah. Latina, this is very interesting. And I, I'm curious, because I missed the beginning, uh, what is it that you're doing? Are you putting something together for a project or an article or just uh, exploring the ideas? Yeah, it's, it's, it was just, I was thinking the whole day why I was suggesting this um, topic today. Okay. And, and then I identified this problem or what the issue of yes. different educational purposes mm -hmm. when speaking the discourse of good relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I wanted to explore it with you. Well, it's very interesting. I'm glad you uh, glad you brought it up. You know, I'm so thank it was so interesting uh, night tonight with you. Yeah, I want to also say I'm writing a, a paper about uh, teacher orientation that Eugene mentioned a couple of times, and uh, one of the things that uh, yeah, I have started to do, uh, I'm writing that paper for a long time. But I'm reconceptualizing something. And I started uh, very much in that direction, that educational purposes will give different teacher orientations. And that teacher orientation is in, in a way defined by purposes and by relationships. So this is what you did. Uh -huh. Can I quote you? Uh -huh. <laughs> it's because it's yeah. interesting. And can we develop it even further, maybe? Yeah, we would. But, but sorry, but I don't uh, know what paper. Uh, I'm just writing. I'm just writing. I'm in a process. You are very interesting. Yeah, because we can. We have another project, Brian. We are. We could, uh, you've made you want to us with me. I can uh, sh send you what I have so far, and maybe you want to join me. Please. Yeah, please, Brian. We are also having a project of methodological project. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, about. Right? Yeah, about the differences between what we call dialogical analysis and discourse analysis. Perhaps you are interested. Yeah, yeah, of course. All right, you cut off. Perhaps I'm what? Um, on the one hand, we have discourse analysis and right. conversational as a, as a research method. Uh-huh. And we are wondering, Anna, please, you can perhaps uh, articulate it better than me. And we are contrasting it with dialogic analysis. Dialogic analysis versus discourse analysis. Yeah. Okay. A dialogic research, let's say, not even analysis. Dialogic research approach yeah. versus discourse research. Okay. Are you interested? I'm interested, yeah. 
That sounds interesting to me. I, I, time is always my issue, Tina. But, uh, <laughs> and everything is interesting uh, to me, well, which is also your... a problem. <laughs> <laughs> everything is your issue. Yes. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah. let us maybe finish with uh, questions that my students often yeah. ask, and my students who are future teachers, and they always, uh, not always, but often ask that question, uh, can teacher be a friend with the student? And uh, that's yeah. one kind of question. And there's opposite question, which is, should a teacher be a friend uh, with the uh, student to be a good teacher? And uh, so I don't know if you want to say something on that, or we just keep it open for the, our audience. What, <laughs> what, what do you think? Tina, what do you think? These two questions, and they're coming opposite sides, actually. For my students, they feel opposite sides, because some students uh, feel uh, that a, a teacher should never be a friend with the student, uh, for many different reasons, like the students will take advantage of you, you're using teacher power, it's not good. Uh, you're losing your authority. And the opposite side, uh, uh, it's reverse kind of idea that maybe uh, uh, in order to have good teaching, you must yeah. friend with your students, which brings difficult questions like how come it's, you're having uh, studio, people who randomly uh, come to you and you suddenly become a friend to everyone. And, and there is suspicion that friendship, first of all, is it even possible? And is it a good idea to uh, force on that kind of friendship? Like friendship is kind of special relations with special and it people. Happens or doesn't happen. Uh, happen doesn't happen. And what if it doesn't happen? It means you're a bad teacher yeah. and things like that. Also, is it desirability? Yeah. Is that friendship is a good a model for teacher-student relations? Brian, what do you think? Uh, I don't think there's any single answer to that. I think it's it's a good question to ask again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. um, and also, what is, what is a friend? I think to be a friend, it's usually defined between the people who are friends. Um, so I, I, outside of that, I'm not exactly sure what a friend is without, you know, in dialogue with a friend, what, does our, what is our relationship? What does that mean? Um, yes. and and I think becomes, part of the question becomes, Brian, I can be teaching good when teacher and students are not friends. Yeah, sure. That can happen as well because you can uh, um, engage in provocation with students and their ideas. And it doesn't mean you necessarily like or dislike the, the students you're engaging with those ideas, but you can engage in interesting ways and in ways that you think uh, care about or give care to or respectful of who that person is and what their interests are and, and what kinds of things might provoke them or guide them towards interesting things. And so I think you're still caring, but you're not, often friendship involves liking the person. And I have to say, I, I usually find something I like about my students, but um, I would not say I want to be friends with a lot of them. And that's fine. It's a, it's a group that's arbitrarily ended up in front of me or assigned to my classes. It's we don't have to be friends. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, a Bakhtinian approach that some of our colleagues have, that the teacher is the author of the student's subjectivity, and the students are heroes in the teaching uh, uh, novel. Some of our Bakhtinian colleagues hold that opinion. Uh, it's another, but we don't have time to explore what it means. But if, right. Well, <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, well, it's a pleasure talking. I'm glad. I hope you will also, guys, will be interested in participating in some future podcasts. You see, it's very yeah. easy. You don't need to prepare. You don't need to read articles for that. <laughs> <laughs> you just oh, that's <laughs> uh, Is this a podcast? Yeah, this, this is a podcast. podcast. <laughs> oh, okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know it was a podcast. No, I had no idea. Yeah, it's, you have been recorded, right? Yeah. Uh, you could be found then on YouTube and internet that you said certain things. <laughs>
Yeah. Right. Oh. <laughs> and this is the second who's back. No, I think I'm safe. <laughs> <laughs> safe environment. Safe learning. <laughs> and we're not safe going to... Yes. <laughs> and we're not going to ask permissions of your parents for putting <laughs> me <laughs> Right. I have no parents. <laughs> <laughs> well, it means your daughter in this case, mm -hmm. Tina. We're not asking your daughter permission <laughs> to put you. And by the way, <laughs> for, for a few seconds, she was in the frame as well. We're not asking your permission. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks for so so good reflections from from all of you. Well, yeah, thank you for guiding very, us. Very, yeah, thank you, Tina. I'm very grateful. Yeah, and you were actually you did prepare for that, and you, uh, you developed <laughs> interesting framework. Interesting framework. Oh, okay. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.